what? And welcome to Profile Pod TV. Double A back for another spectacular episode of the pod. We have a dandy in store for you, as I like to say. I mean, we got we got a, we caught a big fish tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, he's standing by, as you can see. Uh, before we get into our guest, I just want to go through our uh, housekeeping items, as I, I like to do every episode. You know, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Um, follow us on Instagram. Leave me a rate and review on Apple Podcasts. I need to get the feedback. I love the constructive criticism. I, w- I want to know what you think about the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. It's very important to me uh, what the audience thinks. So leave me leave me some comments. Leave me some, some feedback on Instagram or, or uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. So uh, we are uh, also on Social Nostra, a talented group of creators and influencers and podcasters available on Roku, Instagram, Social Nostra TV, and uh, there's something there for, for everybody. Go check this out, guys. Give us a follow on Social Nostra. So um, let's get down to brass tacks. Let's get down to our guest here. This gentleman, is uh, he, he's no stranger to the world of entertainment. He's been in the business for a long time. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the creator of Chicano Hollywood, my man, Johnny Murillo. How are you, brother? Good, 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 bro. Thank you for having me on, dude. I mean, your your podcast is so freaking fire, man. And and you had so many cool people. So put me on the list. And I was like, yeah, dude, let's do it. I'm excited, dude. Oh, man. No, thank you for saying that, man. And, and let me just say this, Johnny. And, and you impressed me, man. And I, we, we talked about it just a moment ago. Uh, Johnny just got off a flight. And uh, he, he was so gracious to keep things ske- the, keep the schedule going. And he could have easily requested a... a you know, postponing it or rescheduling. And and that's an indication to me that he is where he is because of his commitment, his drive. And that, it, so thank you, Johnny, for, for, for doing that, man. I, I, oh, I'm really appreciative. Of that. Yeah, no, and we just came in from Hawaii. Um, that sucks. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was bittersweet. We, uh, yeah. we, you know, went to take my, my mom's ashes out there. She, yes. you know, she's, uh, she was born in Calexico and most of, uh, you know, as a child, you know, between Mexico and uh, San Jose and born raised, but she always had this thing for Hawaii. So she went in the seventies, I think her and two sisters, my two Thea, so they went and uh, she fell in love with it. She comes back and I'm in our house, she put this, I mean, we had a small house in the body in San Jose, right? So mm-hmm. that small little, the, our house was over 100 years back then you know so wow. so it was a, a small house but it's, we had one wall right and she put this huge mural of a of a coconut tree and a beach and all that little hawaiian looking thing and she had that on her whole life our whole my whole life as a you know growing up as a kid we just knew that was the hawaii wall so she had this thing for hawaii so then when she you know after taking she did a couple more trips and then uh she retired and she went because i'm going to hawaii i've always wanted to live there so she went out there and freaking found this apartment on the North Shore and just lived there and uh, her retirement year. So we were all happy for her, you know, it's like, okay, you did what you always wanted to do. Wow. And she eventually came back and um, she told us, you know, when I go, I'm, when, when I go with the Lord, uh, take my ashes to Hawaii. So we're like, all right. So, so we did. So we took her and we, uh, it was cool. We took on a boat and the captain was so cool. Uh, we went out over by Diamond Head. If you're familiar with Hawaii, by Diamond Head. I saw the video, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I placed her in there. It's funny because I put her in and then she went under the boat. And I'm like, looking underneath. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so all the lays and all the pedals were being thrown. And I just yeah. come up and say, uh, no, 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 she's on that side, you know. But then we just we just watched her float around until she finally sank. And um, the uh, captain's going to send us the coordinates because he put a GPS thing in there. So, uh, so we'll get the coordinates. And so... You know, when, you know, from the beach, I could tell where we're at. There's that, I forgot what, Queen Anne Hotel or something like that. The pink hotel that's on the, in Waikiki. Right in front of that to the left is where we left her. So I know that when we go to that beach, we can stare that way. And we'll be like, hey, mom, we're here, you know. So, but it was it was beautiful. It's beautiful. Bittersweet, but uh, we yeah. finally put her to rest and she's in Hawaii now, you know. That's amazing, man. No, I, I saw the video, like I said, man. And yeah, how, how what a special uh, event, you know, like you said, uh, albeit bittersweet but um yeah, yeah hawaii man is i love hawaii man it, yeah. uh you know you know i went first time one of the 
I think it was the second time I went, man. This is back in 06. And uh, I, I, li- I li- literally didn't want to come back home, man. I, yeah. Uh, I was like really sad. I was just, uh, you know, I yes. it's just, you know, so impressional. Hawaii just did something. Yeah. And it's, 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 you know, you feel, I, we lived there for a year. I did an internship out there one time. Oh, wow. With the, with the church. I was a pastor for years. So I went out there and did an internship. And uh, when I we got there, the Oahu was huge, right? So, you know, we had a car shipped over there. We got a, a condo over by Pearl Harbor. And so the, the Oahu was a huge island. So we just cruised around exploring it every weekend, every day we had available. We'd go into the beach every day. But five months into it, I, I kept hearing like, you know, hey, you might get a rough fever. You know, that's oh. the, my, the pigeon talk. I said, rough fever, what's that? And like five months into it, I'm like, Okay, the sign is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and yeah, right about six, my internship was a year. So uh, right about seven months in, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm ready to go back to the mainland, you know. So we so stopped the going fever? to the beach. Yeah, you know, we stopped going to the beach. It was just another town, just you know, another freeway, you know, another crazy traffic. It was just another city. Now our assignment was done. So then we uh, moved to Sacramento. But but yeah, that was, uh, that's how it was. We had, we had a good time. So it's worth very connected there so i have a lot of friends there you know good people there so uh you know now mom's there so i'm sure we'll be doing a lot of frequent flyer miles on hawaiian airlines going back and forth you know definitely man hey, how, how long was your mom there uh but did she get it during her retirement she's only a year just, oh just one year yeah yeah, yeah. Just came back and uh mm. she wanted to help my sister with her son and and be uh be another adult because he was still a little boy but no she, doubt yeah, yeah, she wanted to stay. She wanted to stay the rest of her time, but she came back to. She's a good mom. She's always making sure that we were okay. So my sister needed help. She was a single mom, and so my mom said, "Okay, I'll leave Hawaii. I'll go move in with you, and I'll be there. So when he comes back from school, there's someone there." So yeah, so she's a good lady. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. No, you know, the first time I went to went to Hawaii was 1996. I was on the USS Nimitz uh-huh. a carrier. When I was in the Navy, wow, we, we pulled into Pearl Harbor, bro, on the on the uh, carrier map. So that was that was kind of cool to, to yeah, go bad, that dude. way. Uh, just just mind boggling, man. You know, we went through right past the uh, the uh, Arizona. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that is that's surreal. Monument. Moment. Yeah, the monument. Yeah, yeah. Thank well, thank yeah. you for serving, brother. That's thank you. Oh, of course, man. No, no, man. I I appreciate you saying that, man, and. Uh, you know, it was my pleasure, brother. You know, yeah, well, thank you so much. We all need to appreciate our vets. You know, I just put a post on Chicano Hollywood. Uh, uh, there's a uh, an account uh, called We Got Your We Got We Got Your Six. Yeah, and Echoes World. Yeah, they're big on getting veterans involved in acting and on set and stuff. So, so yeah, yeah, and we, and we have a partnership with them that when we do productions, we're going to try to get their guys involved and you know just kind of create more opportunities for vets to to get involved in Hollywood. You know. That's beautiful, man. Yeah, I've, I've connected with with those guys, and yeah, we are following each other on Instagram, and we, we had a short dialogue, but uh, on the DM, but uh, definitely, man. See, that, that's Johnny. You're awesome, man. You're always um, looking to grow and, and connect the community, man. Oh and, yeah, yeah. We you, got you. You, you know, it's just it's really nice, man. I'm I'm glad that I, I met you, man, and finally got to connect with you, man. And um, you grew up in San Jose, as you mentioned, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. When did when did you come down uh, to so- Southern California? Uh, so we came in two thousand and nine. Uh, oh, really? From Sacramento, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was raised in San Jose. You know, I'll give you a backstory there. So I was raised yeah. typical Latino life. You know, my my family's from Mexico. Um, mm-hmm. My grandfather was uh, Bracero, so okay. he came with when working. And then you know, it's funny his story, but on the on the while he's working. On, in the cherry orchards and on the fields, the army recruiters came during World War II and said, hey, you want your citizenship? Um, join, you know, sign right here. So grandpa went and signed and uh, he served in World War II and got his American citizenship. So because of that, um, you know, all, you know, the rest of the family, my, well, my mom was born in Calexico. My, her older sister, my tia, my tio, they were born in Mexico. So little by little, they just started, you know, because he was a the whole family, you know, uh, we all moved up. They all moved up to San Jose, you know, uh-huh. and, uh, they worked the cherry orchards. There was a big ranch out there called Monfrino's Ranch. And my grandfather was a foreman on there. 
And I remember as a kid in the early 70s, me and my older brother, we would go with them. You know, my mom, my older cousins, they have the memories of working in the fields, mm -hmm. right? I can't say that. I All I did, me and my older brother, we just went with grandpa because he was the boss and we climbed the cherry trees and we eat cherries till we got diarrhea, right? And then <laughs> he would flood the orchards, right, to water them. And then we'd have to freaking cry out, Grandpa, Grandpa, we're, you know, we're stuck. And he'd come and rescue us. So a lot of memories like that, you know. So we were, uh, you know, as kids, we had that, what you saw on on, um, on uh, the, what do you call it, the La Bamba. La, yeah. The orchards, yeah, yeah. So, but that was San Jose back then. That was before the Silicon Valley. Oh. And that, yeah, that's all where the Silicon Valley is now where all those big, that was, you know, all the ranches and stuff. So, but, um, okay. but yeah, that was then. And then, so I was raised there, you know, raised in, uh, in, you know, on the, on the West side, if you're from San Jose, anyone listening, scene, then y'all was raised by Alma Den and Alma where the DMV was, uh, at the time that was Barrio Libre, then it turned into a uh, West side mob, <laughs> you know, all that. So back in the seventies and eighties, we all had our barrio names, our turf names and all that, you know, kind of nearby barrio horseshoe. So if you're from San Jose, you know what those terms means, you know, so but yeah, that's what I was from. So we're born there, born and raised in San Jose, you know. Okay, okay, yeah, no, and, and uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned La Bamba, and I remember that at the beginning of that movie, uh, you know, the, the subtitle pops up, Northern California, they don't specify yeah. where that is, they're in the, you know, they're, they're picking the, the fruit, but um, I, yeah, it could very well be, or it was. It sounds, could be, yeah, I don't know where it was filmed at, but I'm sure it's up in the orchard areas, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 no doubt, man, no doubt. It, it, we, growing up, Johnny, were you uh were you interested in in, in acting and in, in, in the world of entertainment or well, yeah what, what were some you influences? What, yeah yeah i'll tell you it's funny so um so I was, because i was raising the, in the body of lifestyle right my, my step my my real dad you know he was a wino you know they, they call him homeless you know now but they're he was a, he was a freaking wino he got he was an alcoholic mm. chose the street so i didn't really know him that well stepdad um you know he came in the picture he was involved in you know um uh involved he was involved right so we had a lot of a lot of uh you know he, he would rebuild low riders all the time so i was raising low rider culture big time you know he in our house was the house that all the homies would come to and uh he, you know we've had drive-bys at the house in the 70s before drive-bys were popular in the 90s you know so we had that kind of a, a nut bringer right real intense you know you know some some a lot of some domestic violence at times stuff like that right um and raising cholo culture right this is back boulevard nights came out everybody's a cholo that kind of stuff right um <clears throat> so that's how i was raised now but i was the guy it's funny because i look back how, how how crazy my life was but um i remember in in junior high right you know real cholos they don't register register for classes the, the semester before you just kind of show up right so uh that's what, for some reason we just thought that's what we did so in junior high we're going to eighth grade I didn't, we didn't register. So me and this other homie got put in a drama class. And you're talking to two wannabe little cholitos in the drama class. And this is an all white school. So this is when the whole busing thing happened. So they, they basically took us from our, my you know, pure Latino, Chicano, Mexicano elementary school. Uh -huh. They split us up and they bust half of us over to an area called Willow Glen. Willow Glen was your white side of town, right? So there was like in our junior high, probably about 1,200, maybe 2,000 kids. And there was probably 300 of us, you know, Cholitos walking around, right? So it was, we had racial tension, but it wasn't like over-exaggerated. You know, we basically wanted to punch out the stoners because we want to hang out under the bleachers. You know, that kind of stuff. They punched us, <laughs> we punched them. Later on in high school, became friends, right? So so it was just that kind of dumb stuff, pushing around, no big deal. But but we were still, you know, the, the Cholito life was big. You know, the gang life was, was creeping in hard. We had a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff. So in the eighth grade, me and this other homie were put in this drama class. And the first day of school, the teacher, Mr. Van Houten, he, he's going through everyone and he's saying, Okay, first day of class, I want you to get up on the stage and you have to do something, either say your name, do a monologue, which at the time I didn't know what a monologue was, but do a monologue, repeat some lines, just do something. So he's going through people in alphabetical order. So he gets to my homeboy and he looks at him and he says, okay, you're up. And, you know, my homeboy's like, freaking Cholo, Cholo's yeah. and stuff, right? So he's like, you know, no way, man. And the teacher says either you do it or you get out. 
and you leave my class. So homeboy says, F you, and he gets up, makes a stink, and he walks out, right? Okay. And so I stayed. <laughs> I stayed, and, and then they went around, and then they got to the M's. Okay, Murillo, John, Johnny Murillo. And um, I said, that's me. He looks at me and goes, are you going to go up, or are you going to go with your friend? And right there, I thought, I looked okay. around, all these white kids, and I'm like, oh, heck, no one knows me here. So I just did it. So I went up on stage. And all I did was, hey, my name's Johnny Murillo. I just did it big like that, right? Okay. And so when I got down, the teacher, Mr. Arnani, came up to me after class. He says, hey, you got something. I want you to stay in this class. I want you to participate. And I've, I'm still trying to be hard. Like, oh, man, I don't know. I don't know. Right, right, right. But it's <laughs> inside, though. I was excited, right? Okay. So long story short, you know, the, you know, he was getting me up there. I'm doing all the stage stuff with him. No one knew I was going to class. And then the school play comes around and he comes, he says, Johnny, I want you to audition for the lead role. The play was called Never Spindle, Mutilate or Fold, because I want you to audition for the lead role. And I'm like, heck no, dude, because you'll put my picture on a poster. You put it on class, I'll get my butt kicked. So there is no way I can do it. And he's all, you know, he says, you need to, because I know you'll get it, right? And I said, no. And I said, I can't, there's no way. And so I didn't do it, because I would have got my butt kicked, right? There's no way I would have survived, right? right and right. so I, um, I remember when everyone did auditions, I didn't audition for nothing. But when the list came out, they put it on the wall, just like a high school musical scene. All the drama, the class was there. They're looking at the list to see who got what. And then they scattered. And then I walked up to it just to see who got the lead role because I was going to, you know, I thought I should have got or I should have done. I was regretting a lot of regret. And the lead mm -hmm. role went to a kid named David Martz. I remember that everything, right? Mm -hmm. But then I saw it down where it said, third boy, Johnny Marillo. And I'm like, what? Shoot, I got a part. I didn't even audition. And I got a part. And I'm like, okay. So I, uh, I, I did it, dude. I didn't tell anybody that I was in that school play. I didn't even tell my mom. I told nobody. And I didn't tell my brother. So when you're talking after school, when you're having rehearsals, all the homies are hanging out, right, waiting for the buses to come. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? You know, talking my stuff. Then I would just slip away. <laughs> and I would go to a drama practice, right? Yeah. And then we did the play three weekends and matinees and nights and I would just sneak away and I didn't tell my mom or nothing. And I did it for three weekends. And I was in like this box that looked like a computer. I'm up there like a, you know, crazy kid up there doing my role, never spend a little later fall. And right there. So when I realized I love this stuff, I it's in me. And that what was, was hard is like, this is what a lot of Chicanos go through is that we don't have the encouraging atmosphere to develop those artistic skills. Now it's growing more and more, but this is back in, you know, in the eighties, early eighties. And, uh, you know, it was do or die. It was low rider culture. It was, you know, all that. And, and not that that's holding us back, but back then the atmosphere, my particular family atmosphere didn't have the encouragement, the encouraging environment. Yeah. And so I had to hide it all. Right. I mean, it was crazy, but, um, but, a lot of our community goes through that because, oh, it's for sissies or for, you know, being on drum, you know, those just stereotypes and all that. And, uh, but I, I pushed through all that and I realized I love this stuff. And, um, and I started picking up. That's why I think, you know, my, I, I, this is great, you know. And, and I, from then, you know, we, we got plugged into a church and then I got in all the church plays and I played the Apostle John, I played the Apostle Paul. Then I went to Bible school. And in Bible school, there was a big, big thing on choir, right? Then Bible schools love choirs, but there was no drama class. So I went to the to the president of the school and said, can I start a drama team? And they let me start a drama team. So based out of the school, so over my college years, I took this team and I traveled throughout the nation. And we would do these plays in churches and big youth rallies and stuff like that. So that's where it all came. And, you know, and then once uh, cameras started coming out, right, got a little video camera and started making silent movies because I didn't know how to do sound <laughs> stuff like that so yeah I just started doing a lot of fun stuff like that so it's always been in me the I had to push through the environment but thank God you know you know when when you you're, you have a purpose in in your life uh there it's going to come come out and you just got to grab a hold of it so that's that was my upbringing you know and then uh and then you know we had a career in ministry and we pastored and worked with a lot of youth ministries and i always did taught them drama i always taught them skits did a lot of sketches a lot of theater stuff and then when we were the last church we pastored was in sacramento and while we were there 
we went to a pastor's conference in Modesto. Okay. We're at, we're checking into the double tree there. Right. And the lady says, cause she saw my three kids. She says, are you, uh, are you here for the, the casting call? And I said, well, what's a casting call? So oh, there's people from Hollywood looking for child actors. And we had the night open. So I looked at my kids and I said, Hey, you guys want to do this? You know, and they're like, nah, nah, nah. I said, come on, let's do something. I said, I'll give 25 bucks to whoever does it. Right. And just to give them some spending money. And like, okay, okay. So all three of them do it. And they go through this like cattle call kind of thing, right? It's casting for kids. And, and they all got scouted and we followed through it. They got some callbacks and then they got picked up. They got a manager. So well, the three of them got into print model and, and some child acting, just small stuff, you know, and yeah. they on the San Francisco market. And, um, and that's how we started getting plugged into it more. I was now a parent, uh, especially my son was getting some roles. So I'm a parent on set and I'm looking and I'm learning. Uh, and then some other, you know, circumstances happened that uh, we ended up in Hollywood, you know, just, you know, we, uh, some things turned around and next thing you know, I'm in Hollywood. So that's what happened, you know, so. Wow, man, that is, uh, that's amazing, man. Do you, going back to, um, you know, that, or that first role, right? Or when you were the third, third boy i think it was you know where you didn't tell your mom do you regret that not telling your mom oh yeah man i you know i wish um it would have been fun to have audits and i saw that too the you're talking the matinees and the nights you had all these white parents there right Mm -hmm. and i would see you know and and i don't mean it white and make you rate but there's a white school (laughs) so there wasn't any chicanos and no one else i was the only one in that Uh play and they would, you know, I would see the parents at the end would come and congratulate their kids. They would bring flowers to the girls and they would go and hug the guys. And I would just, I'd see it. And by this time, my step, my stepdad has already been, you know, he's already killed. They, they, that's another story. They had a contract on them. They took him out. Right. So that's, mm-hmm. that's the body of life. Um, but then, so I had a single parent. And uh, I would see this, right? And I would see the parents coming, the congratulations, and they'd all go out to eat and do whatever. And I would just walk away. And I would just say, you know, you, you'd have that sense. And, you know, my, my daughter wants to make a movie this part of my life, right? But um, there was a sense where I'm like, I'm missing something. And I regret not telling my mom. She got pissed when I finally told her. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> she was like why don't you tell me and she was always working too so but she would have made it work to go to at least one you know right. so and then take my ts or something they would have they would have went i just didn't tell them you know it's just something that unspoken uh, or unwritten rules that like yeah. you just don't do it you know so but uh but but it was, yeah there, to answer your question there was a lot of regret that i didn't um make it public that i was doing that you know yeah. Same time, I would have got my butt kicked by the homie. So yeah, <laughs> so oh, pros and cons, pros and cons, and everything, you know. Exactly, man. You, you know, it's it's interesting how growing up as a you know Chicano or you know uh, Latino or in, in the culture, you know, like as you mentioned that, you know, it, it wasn't uh, that type of thing wasn't encouraged. You know, like the the, the you know, artistic or, or acting or music, you know generally speaking right yeah being a musician you know that type of thing you know our parents were just they were working and uh, they were just trying to put food on the table man and, yeah. and uh, they there was a lot of uh, autonomy uh, as us kids you know uh you know trying to get uh you know dinner ready and, and doing our homework and you exactly know, our parents were you know getting home before they got home yeah uh, so we're, you know, that, that, that's sometimes, uh, that's the dynamic a lot, man, unfortunately, but I, like, as you mentioned, uh, that's changing now, you know, as, as, t- as, you know, as, as time goes on, um, I think we're, we're seeing, uh, and we'll get into that, you know, we're seeing a lot more Latinos and Chicanos and in, in the world of entertainment in, in general, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think that was a very common back then. Yeah, it was, you know, and, and we, and it makes sense as, and I, I, um, I was making this observation the other day about how, like in, in Hollywood now, there are some Latinos in some very prominent places. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them, not many are Chicano, though, right? There's some other for Colombia, Venezuela, they're, they're yes. places, right? Dominican, all that. And, and I used to wonder, how do they get so high so quick? Mm. They're talking, you're on, they're, they're in HBO, they're in these places. How do they get so high so quick? Mm. And I realized a lot of them, have come from i'm not saying all of them so don't know no hate text or nothing like that but a lot of them come from the upper one or two percent of their nations 
you know they're they're coming from the upper crust of paraguay the upper crust of colombia the upper crust so they had that support from the beginning to go and achieve big things a lot of us we're coming from the fields yeah. we're coming from the canneries you know my uh my family when they went from the fields to work in the canneries on race street in san jose and everybody worked at the canneries now my older brother was probably the last one of us cousins and all about my cousins and all that but they everyone the, it was, the whole thing was you turn 16 you work at the cannery right when i uh, those years i mean we were encouraged to work right away from from paper routes to mowing lawns to whatever you have to work you have to make money mm -hmm. and you know when i got into my early teen years i'm like I'm, i don't want to work at the cannery i uh i got I was big into cars so i got my my one of my first jobs was, was fixed was uh working on trucks when they'd come in and i would grease them up and get them all ready for the next drives and all that and then of course we get into fast food that's back in the 80s you could pick a job up anywhere right so we got into fast food working at the mall as a mall rat and all that. I, you know, I lived that 80s life, right? Um, yeah. So, but it was in us. Go make money. You know, my mom from the get, like, okay, you're uh, nine years old. Why don't you mowing lawns? You know, she was, yeah. she would tell you. So our, our and family, our, our community dynamics were different because we were encouraged to uh, trabajar, go make some money. And, that's why I look now in Hollywood. Why are we've been here the longest, but we're not as influential. When other people come from other Latino countries, they just go straight to the top. And it's because they're coming from the 1% of the country. And I applaud them. I applaud them. I'm not hating on anybody, but right. it makes sense for why we have been here the longest, but we're still in second or third place. So, you know, we're getting close. We're going to take our place and it's coming. I really, really believe that our Chicano voice, and I say this a lot, it's, it will only get louder when there's more of us. And we are getting to that point where there's more of us and they're going to, they're going to take note, you know, yeah. and that's what we, that's the plan behind it. But, but yeah, I think, um, you know, I think our, our, our childhoods were different and they weren't, my, our parents weren't telling us to hey, go be a movie producer. They were yeah. telling us to, they're, they're tell, telling me go work in the cannery. And get it, even if you have to drop out of high school, go work in the cannery. That's what my grandma wanted, you know. Yeah. Well, he's already 16, pull him out of high school, he can work in the cannery. And that was my grandma's advice. My mom said, No, 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 my kids are gonna go to college. So my mom had big visions for us, you know. But but for the most part, the 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 dynamics of our community are ponte trabajar and yep. go make money and work for the man and work or work for the government. Work for the government. They're going to take care of you. There's that's always those are the things. Work with someone else, and they, they we didn't have that strong entrepreneurship value. And exactly. I think that's growing and that's changing. We're becoming entrepreneurs, taking risks, getting into technology, getting into uh, other areas that are growing. You know, and, and that's that's with us and getting into the entertainment industry. You know. You, yeah, you, I mean that's it, Johnny, right there, man. Um, yeah, I remember my, it was never about you know starting yeah starting your you know business or or it was never the, the, the mm -hmm. that was never the topic of conversation. It was always expected you yeah you know you're gonna go to work and yeah. whatever that was make you know, a wage, bring home a check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, exactly, man. Who were some of your um, acting influences earlier on, Johnny? As you were coming up, man, who did you have uh, some of those uh, your favorite actors, uh, whether they were Latino or, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. You know, what's funny, this is what happened to me. So right around 1985, uh, I was my senior year in high school. Like I said, I lived the Chicano breakfast club life, right? Me and my me and my buddies, right? If, again, if you're San Jose, you know what this means. We all we thought all we did was cruise King and story and mess around, right? Oh, that's all we just saw every week was about partying. So anyways, I, you know, long story short, I didn't finish high school. I got kicked out. <laughs> so my life was a mess. And I said, okay, I need some help, right? So I, I went to Bible school and my pastor sent me to Bible school, right? But it was a very strict Pentecostal Bible school. No movies, no music, no, no, they got secular mo no secular movies, no secular music, no nothing. So you're talking from 1985 to about 1998. I was out of pop culture big time wow. and you know, I didn't go to movies or nothing. I was in the ministry preaching the gospel. <laughs> That's all I went. I traveled the world. I've, you know, I've, 
uh, you know, back in the day, I used to go into any city and pack out stadiums back in the day, right? Pack, pack out big auditorium and stuff and I travel the world preaching the gospel and all that stuff. So that was my life in between uh, the 90s, especially. So I was out of pop culture when I got plugged back into it, it was like early 2000s and, you know, had my own little revelations on how how God approached, you know, <laughs> movies and stuff. And then next, I didn't know that he was going to call me into it. So, but in all those years when I would always look at, and I'm going to sound like a fan girl right now, but um, I don't, I'm not easily impressed by, I'm not, I'm impressed by everybody, but I don't get stargazed at all. You know, like one of the, the close celebrities I actually had good conversations with is what the day that I realized I'm getting kind of, you know, to me being in Hollywood is a calling and so when I felt that calling was, I was, um, 2007, we had just, we had planted a church pastoring in Sacramento. It was, a, it was an inner city church. Uh, if you're from Sacramento, then you know where Oak Park is, you know, where Fruit Ridge Community Center. So we were in, we were in the hood. It was the freaking hood. My church was 300 of the most beautiful black, um, Hmong, um, Asian, uh, Latino people you're ever going to see, right? They love me. I love them. And uh, we were reaching prostitutes, pimps, drug addicts, and we were just had a good time. But uh, they didn't always have the money to pay, help pay the bills. <laughs> so when the economy tanked, uh-huh. uh, right before we had just gone to this huge building and we we're really about to explode, but then the economy tanked, so we had to shut it all down. So I'm going through this crisis in my, my heart, like 40, you know, I'm 40 years old by this time. And I'm like, oh man, I, what did I do? I messed up and I have to shut the church down. We were heartbroken. I'm trying to find work where I'm already losing my house. Right. I was in the first wave of mortgages, the mortgage crisis. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to put food on the table. Yeah. So again, my kids were scouted. Right. So I'm getting emails from, uh, it's casting networks, but it's the SF casting, San Francisco market, right? Okay. Over here, it's called LA casting, but it's over there, it's SF casting. And so there was a movie called Four Christmases. Mm. And um, they wanted like, you know, 400 background actors, right? So pretty much I'm like, okay, this is work for a couple of days. I'll do it, right? So I submit, yeah. I got it. And this is my first time now as, an, as a talent. I always went to see my kids, but this is my first time as actually, you know, on set. And so while I'm there, it was um, starring uh, Vince Vaughn and Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, so, another movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the movie. Yeah, so in the big airport scene, if you could, you'll see me now. I've got like a tan jacket, right? So during the breaks, okay. um, when Vince Vaughn and Reese Witherspoon are at the counter, they're talking to the kid from uh, uh, from a Christmas Story, right? The little boy that shoots his eye out, right? He's the guy that's playing the 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 airline guy, right? So during the the different takes, right? Vince Vaughn would come and stand next to me, right? So we chatted a little bit, right? So here he homeworks right next to me. And super sweet guy, and he won't remember me from nothing, right? But, um, but we did have some some conversation, there. and I'm I'm like, you know, I'm freaking, I'm talking to this dude like man to man. I mean, I I don't care who he is, right? And right. I, I knew he was an actor and all that, but I'm talking, he's, he's just another man. So we had a good conversation, just chit chatting and all that. And he go do his thing and all that, right? And I remember driving home, and I thought, man, that was crazy, and I really felt like, like. You know, I really, really honestly felt like if I can get a little, little spiritual here, like God was telling me, hey, this is what I'm calling you to do. I'm calling you to Hollywood. And I'm like, what the heck does that mean? You know, I'm like, no way, man. I've been preaching against going to movies for how many years now, right? And I'm yeah, like, yeah. no, you want me to go over there and make them, you know? So, um, but so I've never really had that kind of stargaze of celebrities. But I will say this if I was in the same room with, Tom Cruise, Mel Gibson, and Keanu Reeves. Forget it, bro. I'll be like a 13 year old girl uh, looking at, you know, I mean, I, that's how. So those three dudes uh, will be the ones that I'd be like, dang, you know, that's Tom Cruise, especially Tom Cruise. People trip on him for whatever his reasons are. He does his crazy stuff, but Homeboy's crazy. He does his own stunts. You oh, know? Man. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, Mel Gibson, I mean, he has his own issues that they put in the whatever he's done, but he's freaking legit. So, anyways, yeah, those are the three dudes. Keanu Reeves, because I love his work, and then I would say, oh, how's, I, I hear how oh, he's such a sweet guy, and yeah. then Tom Cruise and Mel Gibson. Those three dudes, I'll be like a little little fangirl, you know. I, I we all have those 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 two or three guys, right? I, my mine for me, it's uh, Al Pacino, uh, Robert uh, De Niro, yeah. And, uh, but going back to Keanu, man, it, I was, it's funny you just mentioned him because. I was just reading something literally like like 
before we came on uh, a few minutes before we came on that he, he's, he's worth like 350 million or something. Oh. He still, he still rides the subway in, in New York city. And uh, uh, anyways, but uh, yeah, man. Yeah. I, yeah. And I've seen that video where he gives up his seat for this yeah. lady and all that. I mean, you know, that's, yeah, that's some serious cool. Um, uh, oh, yeah. what, what's the term? Uh, uh, Humility or, or whatever. The, yeah. Whatever the term is where he's just, just a good humble. guy. You know, yeah, 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 man. No, no doubt, man. No, no, no. And it's so, so fast forward now that Johnny, you, 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 um, you know, talk a little bit about what, what inspired you to start Chicano Hollywood. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit about you know, some of the projects you've done recently. Um, but yeah, Chicano Hollywood, man. What, 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 yeah. So let me tell you that this, this is, this is how Chicano Hollywood started. It was, it's going on a year now this month. Um, Barely. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Echoes World, which is Jeff Reyes. Mm-hmm. He's a buddy of mine. He hits me up, right? We've worked on a lot of stuff before and he hits me up. He says, Hey, can you turn this into a script? So he sends me one page. And it was just some ideas. And that was from um, a music producer named John Doe. And, um, and then the guy who's going to direct it, LV, right? And, um, you know, I've known LV for, for years too. He's a good guy. And uh, I didn't know John though, but they, you know, this is one of those COVID ideas, right? They're, um, they're on lockdown mm-hmm. like everybody else. And they, <laughs> put these ideas together <clears throat> so just a one pager you know just one page story of a guy that gets out of jail after 20 years goes back to his neighborhood and you know it's gentrified so they said um you know what can you do with this so then i just started fleshing it out i got out to about 56 pages and then i i hit him back and i said okay here you know this is what i got look through it uh but then let me know like you know what's your what's the budget on this are we going to do helicopters and car crashes or are we, you know we keep it micro budget <laughs> oh no no micro budget it's okay so then we, we together we fleshed it out some more and um we had some dialogue meetings and um there was one meeting where lv he i i have my the script project on the wall and uh-huh. lv is standing in front of it and he's looking at it and we're talking about you know different things and he's smoking a joint <coughs> and he has his he has his blunt in his hand he just does this big puff and it just goes over the script, right? And I'm like, oh, that's a cool picture. So I got my camera out around him. Hey, bro, hey, bro, do it again. You know, I want to take that picture. And he goes, why? I just puff it out. So I made him do it like six or seven times. He's like, I can't, I can't no more, no more, right? And uh, so I, <coughs> I finally got the shot. So if you go to uh, Chicano Hollywood Instagram, it's one of the very, I think it's the third picture you can see the shot. So I get that, that, that uh, picture and I just, as a joke, sent it to my daughter. She was a uh, senior at Azusa Pacific in film school. And I said, check this out. I'm with Chicano Hollywood. That's, uh, that's LV smoking a, a blunt in front of uh, the script. So she sends me back some laughing emojis. Oh, so cool. So I nicknamed that group Chicano Hollywood. And I, and it was just between myself, my daughter, and my wife. And I told, and whenever I would tell my wife, Hey, I got a meeting with Chicano Hollywood. She oh. knew it was them. So I then, then little by little, I would call them Chicano Hollywood, the group mm-hmm. and on set. Now we're in production. Now this is in January. So now we're in March. We've got the script done and um, we're, we're in March and we had, uh, and this had Jerry Garcia. We had concrete, we had Dunos, we had Anthony um, and a couple others, and uh, we, uh, you know, there's all Chicanos, right? All in front of the camera and Chicanos behind the camera. The whole crew, or you know, everyone was right. And um, very cool. And and I think the only white we did have one white guy. He was our production designer, but he was a one of them. You know that that one white dude that's a Chicano anyway, right? So he's actually <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Um, so, so I would nickname them all Chicano Hollywood and whenever everything went, you know, something could happen, we'd applaud each other and Chicano Hollywood. And I saw how they were kind of gathering around it. They loved the term. And then one day the makeup uh, girl, Lizzie, she shows up with these t-shirts and uh, hoodies and it said, or chata with oat milk, Chicano Hollywood. And I'm like, man, this, they really connect with. So I knew like there's something here. So I just said, you know what, maybe we need to do something with this. So I, I trademarked the name and I got the socials. I got the website and I just started building. So I connected um, Instagram with Facebook. I, you know, I, I get on Facebook at the time. I wasn't getting on as much cause I was trying I was just on Instagram. Right. And, but I connected them so that whatever I post on IG would go to Facebook. So I just started posting and all I did was just, just shout outs. Mm. Shout out to Lizzie. She just did this new music video. Shout out to Echoes World. He just produced this new commercial. Yeah. 
you know, and I would just shout people out just to give them some love. That's it. Let me just give people love. Then it just started growing. And I wasn't really focusing on Facebook as much because I knew it was just crossing over. Mm -hmm. But I noticed now, this is now in August, where like in, on Instagram, we had maybe a couple thousand. And right there, I started noticing, wow, this is really organically growing really cool. I'm going to check Facebook. So I go to Facebook and there's like, I think at the time, maybe 12 or 15,000. Wow. And I'm like, what the heck? I had, I had no idea. <laughs> so then I would see all these comments. We need more Chicano content. How come we don't have more Chicano sitcoms? And these are, so I noticed that on Facebook, which right now it's about 35, 34,000. And on Facebook, it's the audience. They're the ones that want more mm. content. On IG, we have about 4,500, I think. Yeah. And and they want, that's the, the players. That's the producers. That's the the uh, the actors. That's the directors, Chicano directors. And I get messages like almost all the time saying, um, hey, thank you for giving us a platform. Thank you for giving us a voice. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, for creating this because now we're getting our shout outs and all that stuff. And these are all Chicanos, right? And, and when I say Chicano too, it's not... It's okay. I'm Chicano, Mexican American, but and that's there's 40 million of us. But I there's also another 10 million that I'm guessing that are, um, you know, they're from El Salvador, they're from Guatemala, right? Uh, they're black, they're Asian, they're white, and they're into the Chicano culture. Mm -hmm. So when I say mm -hmm. Chicano Hollywood, it's about the Chicano culture. Those that understand that, you know, from from low riding to street food to to whatever, but it's a Chicano culture. So so Chicano Hollywood, it's not just Mexican Americans. It's it's a it's actually a cool little mix. We have African Americans that follow us, and they'll hit me up. You know they uh, you know some like uh, VA we're, we're working on some stuff. Right, he's a great writer. He's working with Joe Chacon on a series that we're going to put together. And you know he's a black guy. Joe Chacon's a Chicano guy, and we're all familia, right? And, and we're all in into the the culture. So. Um, there's a lot of that kind of a, a family built. So it's not just Mexican Americans, but obviously part of the primarily is Mexican American, right? So we have that kind of a mix on there. So on Instagram, you have the actors, the directors. I have people from the studios, from Warner Brothers, from Universal, have showrunners. Uh, ben Lobato is one of our partners. And he, uh, you know, he's a showrunner for Queen of the South. He, you know, we we were friends, and he uh, he loves the platform, and he's he's a thousand percent to building more Chicanos. You know, he's a wow. Chicano from San Diego, right? So so he uh, he's a you know very big 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 um, supporter, and and you know going to partner with us on some cool stuff. You know, so yeah, that's that's right. So that's that. So that's the beginning of it. So right now, um, we're we're about ready to pivot and do some more things. But that's how that's how it started. Just you know, start with. Bunch of Chicanos yeah. making a movie called Orchata with Oat Milk. And hopefully that will be out soon, hopefully. <laughs> so Okay, yeah, yeah. Of which you were a writer on, on that on that project, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was, I could say I was the lead writer, but whatever. I was just, I wrote it. And then, of course, um, the, the other guys would come in and they would, you know, Jeff did a lot of the restructuring on it. LB as a director restructured some stuff. Uh the dialogue, right? Dunos, if, you know, Dunos is, a, I think he's 21, 22. He was one of the key roles. So, you know, we would have to have dialogue meetings. So, like, I would say my slang from the 80s. So, to me, you pull a gun out, you say, call it a cuete. Yeah. But I was, it was funny. I said, I told Dunos, says, how would you say that line? He goes, oh, I call it a bang bang. I said, a bang bang? <laughs> That's what you call a gun these days, a bang bang. And then he had some other name too. I'm like, oh, okay. So we'd have to uh, do the dialogue, right? And, and in concrete, he's more the 90s, right? So in Jerry Garcia, you know, so we'd have to just get some dialogue. But so I was, you know, I could say I was a lead writer, but uh, everyone contributed to that, you know. So on the credits, I'm going to get the credit as a lead writer, but, you know, truth be known, all the whole family connected, you know put put uh thoughts in there john doe he put thoughts in there so it's it's a good mix of all of us you know yeah but, yeah. but on that they'll put johnny Murillo as a writer so i'm like okay i'll take that credit you know <laughs> but it was a, no. um, based on the talents of all those guys you know i hear you man i hear you yeah but you know you got to give credit where credit's due and but but I, it's amazing man it's only a year old you know you got a year hard, old yeah, and it's, yeah it's grown such a a very significant following <laughs> And uh, another project is uh, the King of Downey, correct? Yeah, yeah, King of Downey. So um, that one, uh, you know, it's a pilot, and you know, we we had that. You know, the that idea came between myself and uh, another buddy of mine, Sam Court, and we were meeting and talking about. He's from Downey, 
and we had some ideas that we were going through and that's where it came from you know so i i wrote the whole script um and you know the same with that one we i wrote the script and it's pilot so it's only you know the original script is like 30 pages okay. and it's, it's a sitcom kind of modeled after modern family that kind of a style you know mm. um and that one uh you know it, it's it's what's different about that one's not about total wisdom or low rider you know nothing like that this is about a modern la chicano family that they're basically like the jeffersons remember the jeffersons they're moving on up to the east side right yeah so um <laughs> the family is moving from uh Hi um huntington park to uh downing which i guess i mean locals here say downing is like the beverly hills for latinos right for chicago. <laughs> yeah, I was about so, to say. yeah that's the thing right? beverly hills. yeah yeah so we um <laughs> we're using that and so what they are is the couple danny is a real estate agent that's played by jerry garcia okay so he's a real estate agent and he want he works for a company he wants to be his own broker one day so you know he knows that he has to be on the hustle this particular pilot episode is about him um uh you know wanting to get a certain award but for him to get that award he has to sell one more house that kind of thing so that's his that's his challenge through the through that first episode and then his wife um, played by Sonia, she, um, Sonia Balcazar. So she, yeah. she is a, um, like, uh, you, you ever hear like Prime America or, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, those are the, the financial guys, right? So they say, what's a pyramid scam, blah, blah, I say, yeah. you know, I know all those, right. And you know, it's, it's a legit business. So she's one of those. Now what's interesting, uh, Downey, the actual city of Downey has the most real estate agents per capita in the nation. Really? Yeah, and and down is a Latino city, right? So it, most of those agents are Latinos. Like Century Twenty One has a big brokerage there, and there's others. So per capita, yeah, yeah, Latinos are the, in real estate, and they're, they're number one, right? And so uh, there's also a lot of those Primerica, World Financial, Prepaid Legal, right? Yeah, yeah. Latinos, Chicanos, we'd love to get into those. Couple reasons why, you know, early generations don't always go to college. There are some that do. Maybe, but they don't know me. There's not a whole lot to actually finish their BAs. There are some that do, um, but most were going to just go to community college, get one or two years, right? Yeah. There's a desire to be a professional. There's a, a desire to dress up in office clothes, in, in professional clothes and carry your briefcase because no one carries a briefcase anymore today, but back in the day, <laughs> carry your briefcase and go have meetings, right? There's that, that desire is in us to be, to be, you know, at, to, at that level. But again, because of the challenges we have as a community come from the fields to the canneries, to fast food, you know, that kind of thing, you know, a lot of the jobs that we're having are blue collar jobs, you know, in the warehouses, um, you know, maybe in, in uh, other, other industries, but they're, they're not the ones, they're the ones that require uniforms, not a suit, not a, right. a, a pretty business dress or anything, but prepaid legal, Primerica, all those kind of businesses, real estate, they don't require college Mortgage, degrees. Real estate. Yeah. Yeah. They don't require college degrees. You don't have to have a BA. No. All you, you know, you can go past your series six and which anyone can do, and you can uh, pass your real estate license, which anyone can do. So yeah. those are great industries that give, you know, people an opportunity to step into the business professional life. So Absolutely. you'll see a lot of Chicanos, a lot of Latinos that go into those because they have their business meetings, they have their rallies, yeah. you know, even like, like uh, Amway and Quickstar, they would have their big, uh, what's the new ones now is the oils, right? The, the doTERRA. They uh, have those big uh, conferences where everyone gets dressed up and yeah. it gives people an opportunity to, to buy some new clothes that are, that are for business and want. So anyway, sure. Sonia, she plays um, Marcy and Marcy's uh, into, into uh, the primary kind of stuff. So she shows the plan. And she gets people in, in retirement plans and insurance and all that. So we're showing this couple as a, uh, you know, they're a middle-class couple and they're in the business, you know, and then they have three kids and then they have uh, Jay Valentino. He's in it and uh, he's a single dad. So he shows up to the house with a baby and um, <laughs> that baby's my grand grandson, by the way. And I'm uh, loving and this they, uh, concept already, man. This, this premise. Yeah, and it, you know, and, it, and it's it's a fun it's a fun show, and it and it's showing. Um, it's not playing to the stereotypes, although we will have some fun with those. But we're not showing gang members and and that kind of stuff, which I don't have a problem with making a movie about gang members. But you know, we this is going to be different. So this is going to show Latinos 
the modern day Latino, the modern day Chicano. We're in business too. We're, we're dressing up in meetings. We know finances, you know, we know real estate. We have aspirations. Jerry, the, the lead, uh, Danny, he wants to be his own brokerage one day. So, you know, that's what that, so the whole show is around that. Now we have some comedy in there with Marco Para and Concrete. They're competing um, a real estate office. They're the homies that sell homes. Uh -huh. So we, we play into that a little bit, but like those two characters and Jerry Garcia's character, they're all friends in the nineties. They're part of the same party crew. So we're going to tap into the party crew scene too. Oh, so it's a very, very Southern California Chicano uh, story, you know? So uh, we had a lot of great, great, great comments about it. You know, people hitting us up about it. Um, the plan for it right now is uh, we're, we're, you know, part of my, me as the, the owner of it, I, you know, I'm trying to raise some investment money to do the whole season. Um, part of the strategy too is like, I could, um, as the owner, right, it's my, it's my show. Mm -hmm. um, I could take, and I've had offers from sales agents saying, hey, let me try to sell it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll take it to the streaming platforms, Netflix, Hulu, all those. They'll take it to maybe the studios and, yeah. hey, we got the show, look at this pilot. <laughs> What will happen is if anyone picks it up and I sell it to them, I might go, I probably will go with them as a consulting writer, but I wouldn't be the showrunner. Mm -hmm. I won't be the lead writer. I would just be there. And then they would bring in other ones, other writers. They bring in a showrunner um, because I get it. They're going to put some big money into it. They want people to have a bigger track record. I get it. Gotcha. Uh, and then what they'll do is they'll replace the talent. Maybe they'll keep Jerry. Maybe they'll keep Sonia. Maybe they'll keep Concrete. But again, no one's guaranteed they could replace them all. Mm -hmm. And what happens a lot is they're going to replace them with the same names. There's the same Chicano Latino names out there. Yeah. And I understand why, because it's a, they're trying to, you know, uh, lower their risk by putting in familiar celebrity names. Yeah. And, and they're just trying to, you know, I see the business decisions behind it. But what happens a lot is that the same people get their different roles and, and it's good. I celebrate them. I celebrate all those Chicanos that are out there and A-list Chicanos. I celebrate them all. But what happens is because they're there uh, at bottlenecks and there's so many other uh, Chicano talent that are not getting those opportunities. Yeah. So if I were to just sell it, mm. My Chicano crew is not going to have any work because yeah. you know, they'll make it a union thing. And uh, there are a lot of Chicanos in the union, but not not enough to be the whole crew. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then my talent, they're all going to probably maybe they'll all get replaced. Maybe one or two might say, I don't know, but yeah. there's no guarantee. But if I could raise the money and do a whole season myself and it comes out well and we picks up an audience and then we already have an audience watching it um, and they'll watch it on our platform, right? We'll talk about that later, but they'll watch it on our platform uh, and we do eight to 10 episodes, then it's established. And then let's say if one of the big guys wants to come say, hey, we want that show. I'll be like, sure, you could have it. Give me money so I can get another one going so I keep my crews working. But also, this is the talent that's in there. You got to take them all with you. So now all those talent that want to have that shot, they, now they're at the big leagues. Yeah. And I'm, I'm totally happy and content with being uh, a minor league team that's going to feed the Yankees, right? So now all my, my, yeah. my, uh, my, my talent, Jerry, Sonia, Concrete, all of them, now they're going up to a new level. Marco yeah. Pata, all of them are going up to a new level. And they get to go with the show. Now, they'll bring in the union crew which uh, they're not going to all be Chicano, but I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, they'll bring in um, uh, a showrunner that they know, and it's probably going to be a white guy or a white lady, and which is fine. But they're also going to have to bring in some of the writers that I had write that uh, first season. And right now we're working yeah. with Moses Medina. He's uh, He was the director of the pilot episode. Jerry Garcia's... Uh, um, writing in it, Jesus uh, is, um, he's writing it too. So these writers are going to help me write the first season. So they, one or two or three of them are going to go up too. So now we're creating this, this, uh, this kind of ecosystem that yes. let's establish it here and then you go up and you go with them. So that's our plan. That's our plan. So it's not about creating a show and trying to sell it. And I make the, I'm the only one that makes money. This is about, 
creating a, a system that we develop people and they go up together, you know? So, yeah. um, man, Johnny, I, I, I want to thank you, man. I want to thank you for, for coming on and, and taking the time and after your flight and your trip and, um, you know, and, and I'm glad I met you, man. I'm glad I'm associated with you now. I'm glad, uh, you know, uh, you're opening these doors once again, man. And uh, I can't thank you enough, man. Before, before we go, Johnny, where can the good people follow you? Where can they find Please you? follow us on um, Instagram at Chicano Hollywood, on Facebook at Chicano Hollywood, on TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> Chicano Hollywood. We're building our TikTok. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me we're building that that one up that's uh that's a tougher one you know but uh it takes a lot of work so but we're building that one we have about i think 2600 my daughter's uh, building yeah. that one up you know Not bad. um yeah it's a start there and um she's doing a great job and of course we're going to build the snapchat as well so yeah follow us we're going to be launching a we funder so people that are interested in, in investing into chicano hollywood we're going to give everyone an opportunity because that would really help boost a lot of this you know we have had conversations with venture capitalists and angels uh, but they're all looking at saying, well, let's see how you go, you know, count us on the second round, that kind of thing. So we're gonna have to bootstrap this first round. So we want people to grow with us. They invest with us, they'll, they'll make some profit from it as well. But they'll, the main thing is they get behind us. So we'll be launching that, you know, probably by the first of February. So uh, there's a lot going on, but I told my partners, I said, you know what, it would have been nice to have a fat investor come in, yeah. but hey, maybe that's not, well, let's just bootstrap it. And let's just let's just work hard. And we have the tours coming up. We have you know other things coming up. So like we, we can bootstrap this thing. So um, I think with the community that we have, and as it's growing, we're going to be able to get it done. So yeah. So any any um, anyone out there right now listening, follow us so that you can keep yeah. up on the updates. You know, got some mixers coming up. I'm going to have a private luncheon for anyone that signs agreements with us. Like when you sign your agreement, we get your podcast on, we're gonna have a private luncheon in late February. Oh. Uh, and then in March, the goal is to have a, a soft launch uh, mixer again. So those things, but they'll follow us on, on, on social media and they'll get all those announcements. There it is, man. Thank you so much, Johnny. Uh, wow, good stuff, man. Good stuff coming down the pipeline. So I can't wait. I'm excited, man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there you have Johnny Murillo, Chicano Hollywood, Chicano Hollywood TV, Horchata with Oat Milk, uh, King of Downey, and so much more that you just heard. And uh, go follow them. Go join the movement. Uh, if you're Chicano, especially, or not, join the movement, man. Just join. Hang out. Yeah. Yeah. If you like street tacos and lowriders, we're here. We're your family. <laughs> that, that's right, man. Once again, Johnny, thank you so much, man, for being here with us, man. And, I, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening um, or whatever time of day you're watching this. Uh, right now, for us, it's evening. It's midnight here yeah. in Southern California. But uh, yeah, thank you for joining wherever you're joining in. If you're on Social Nostra, if you're on uh, uh, Roku, if you're on YouTube, audio platforms, whatever, thank you so much for being here. For Johnny Murillo, Chicano Hollywood, I'm Double A. Always reminding you to take it easy. <laughs> Thanks again, Johnny. I appreciate you. Okay, brother. God bless, man. Have a good night.